since I've been traveling, I started to hear this phrase when I would go to a place. And, and I, I've heard it four times. I'm going to quickly tell you the four stories. Uh, first, it was, I was going to Sherbrooke, Quebec for a meeting. And I got picked up at the airport. Uh, sweet brother. I'm not certain of his name. Uh, but it was most definitely hyphenated. Jean-Pierre, Jean-Guy, Jean-Paul, Jean-Marc, something like that. Sweet guy. And uh, as we're driving to the meeting where I'm supposed to speak, he began to tell me what a bad meeting it was going to be. No, oh, pastor, this is not a good meeting. He's like, you know, it's going on. People are fighting, and you know, the Catholics and this, and it's going on. I don't, don't, don't expect much for that. And he's going on. He's like, we're driving to the meeting. I'm the speaker. <laughs> and he's just encouraging me the whole way there. <laughs> Terrible meeting. You know, so. And then just before we get there, he says, Pastor. This is a hard place. So I go into the meeting. He was prophetic. It was a terrible meeting. <laughs> the next time it happened was in Russia. Same thing. I don't do this anymore. Uh, got picked up at the airport, and I'm being driven to the first meeting where I'm supposed to speak. So it's like an 11-hour flight. It's an 11-hour time change. It's just your world is upside down. I get picked up. It was the middle of winter, 30 below. It, it was like early in my days, like 92, 93, going to Russia. I'm in a Lada. The Lada is weeping on the inside because of the condensation. And Sergei or Slava or Yuri or Stanislav is telling me what a bad meeting we're going to have. Same thing. He's like, da, terrible meeting. People not coming, they're fighting. You have demon-possessed KGB, orthodox. It's, we have no web. It's bread. I don't know many words, but he's going on. Oh, don't expect much. He's going on and on and on. And we get there. It wasn't a good meeting. It was a, just before we get there, he says, Da, pastor, this is hard place. Same thing. Next time it happened was in Zambia, Africa, Kapeshi. I was going to dedicate a school. We had a guy in our church who loved missions. He passed away. He left some money. We sent it to Kapeshi, Zambia. We built a school. Then his name was John Wynn, but he was gone. So the, the family said, Pastor, would you go and dedicate the John Wynn school? So we go to Zambia, and we're there, and we drive way out to this very, very rural village, very poor Precious people, and we get there, and people are running out of the bush and out of the woods, and they're yelling, John Wind is here! John Wind is here! And I'm like, No, I'm, I'm not John Wind, I'm, I'm Brent, I'm just here for the John Wind school. John Wind, everyone, John Wind is here! And I go into the village, they're singing, they're dancing, Oh, the John Wind school, thank you, John, for coming. So after a while, I'm just saying, Thank you so much, I'm very happy to be here <laughs> to dedicate my school. So we go through the ceremony. They gave me two live chickens, which I really didn't know what to do with. <laughs> Thank you so much. And then at the end of that, they took me aside, the elders. They said, I want you to listen. Oh, they said, Pastor, we have no resources. We have hardly any education, only up now to grade six. Thank you to you and the John Wynn School. In the springtime, our river floods were cut off for four weeks. Our young people have no opportunities. You can see we're in a drought. We have absolutely nothing to work with. This is a hard place. The next time it happened was in Vancouver. I was with a group of pastors. And they started in on the same thing, saying, you know, the people here, they have so much education. They have so many opportunities. They have so many leisure distractions. You know, their kids are in ballet and swimming and baseball and basketball and everything, they have no time for anything, pastor, this is a hard place for the church. Isn't that something? Did you notice that in Zambia, they said, we don't have many resources, so it's a hard place? In Vancouver, they said, we have too many resources, so it's a hard place? Is it possible that every place considers itself to be a hard place? 
And the reality is there is no place on the planet where the gospel is attempting to penetrate that doesn't find opposition and difficulty and challenges and hard places. And in fact, if you think that it was easy for Jesus and Jerusalem was an easy place, just, just look at what Jesus says to these cities that he went to. He began to rebuke, Matthew 11, verse 20, he began to rebuke the cities in most of which most of his mighty works had been done because they did not repent. Jesus, the Son of God, it says in these cities where most of his mighty works were done, those cities didn't repent. Isn't that astonishing? The sinless, miracle-working, power-displaying Son of God found some hard places in spite of him doing so many miracles. You can follow through the Apostle Paul, the teachings. After Paul's first preach, he got almost killed. He had to escape out of the city in a basket. In another place, the disciples left the city and they says they shook the dust off their feet because it was so hard. On and on it goes. You can follow through church history and you read about martyrdoms and you read about saints who tried to evangelize and were chased out of countries. You can read about Bibles being burned. You can read about Christianity being made illegal, proselytization being made illegal. Yes, there are hard places in the earth. There have been historically and there always will be hard places. The devil doesn't just pack up his team when Parkwood people roll into town. Say, oh, I guess we're out of Windsor. Parkwood is here. We're not going to oppose. We're not going to interfere. We're not going to discourage or lie or tempt anymore because the church is here. When the church rolls into town, the devil rises up to oppose even more. It's just a part of what Jesus said we could expect to have happen. Jesus said in John 16, I've told you about all of this so that you have peace. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart, I have overcome the world. People, the history of the, the Christian church is filled with people who have sacrificed. People who have gone to hard places. Many have paid with their lives. Tertullian, an apologist in the Roman Empire, says the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. That's who we are. This is our story. We are actually called to overcome hard things, to rise above them, to see through them. And hard places do not stop the gospel. I have one more hard place story. I was going to Kazakhstan for the first time. And um, I have a businessman friend who does work there. And, and I, you know, I've done a lot of work, a lot of missions work, and so I love it, I love traveling. And I thought maybe Kazakhstan would be a little bit easier place. So I got picked up by the airport. <laughs> They're all picked up by the airport stories, I know. I got picked up by the airport by Pastor Pavel. Never met him before, and we had a four hour drive ahead of us. And uh, Pavel is just the sweetest guy, he's one of my good friends now, but he spoke three words of English. Three, total. They were wow, which means wow, super, alleluia. <laughs> we're driving. He'd look over at me and say, wow, <laughs> super, <laughs> alleluia. <laughs> A few minutes later, we're driving, wow, <laughs> super. And by this point, I'm catching on, and so I'm like, hallelujah. <laughs> Literally, those were the only words that he could speak, so I would join right in. You know, sometimes I'd do the vow, sometimes the super, sometimes just the hallelujah. And then we both got tired of that, and we just drove for about five kilometers, ten kilometers, speaking in tongues, because we couldn't. And that worked a lot better, actually. Wow, super, hallelujah. And then we pray in tongues, and it was all good. By the time we got there, we're both crying, and it was just... Well, I preached in a church that is a registered church there. We didn't know that they had plants from the government. After the service, the pastor came to me. He said, you, got, you, you have to hide in my apartment because they're going to 
make you go to court. If they make you go to court, you'll go to jail. And then it'll be tough for us to get you out for a long time. So you got to hide. So I had to hide in an apartment for two and a half days. And then in the middle of the night, we changed my departure location. So they drove in the middle of the night to another town so that I could leave by another airline. And hopefully my passport hadn't been blacklisted. It's actually a hard place. Every place has its challenges. So what are, what are we going to do? Are we going to roll up? Are we going to quit? Are we going to cave in? I want to give you a few things to do today. The first is this. Is to start speaking and acting with faith. To make a decision this morning. I'm asking everybody in the room and everybody online to make a decision today that instead of speaking negatively, instead of talking about the work of the devil, instead of excusing ourselves from action because it's hard, instead of delaying because it's difficult, instead of whining and complaining about how hard it is here, instead of saying all the reasons why not and all that's gone wrong in the past, everything that's wrong with Windsor, instead of all of that, I want to call you today to a new narrative, a new perspective from the human to the heavenly, from fear to faith, and it sounds like this. This is a blessed place. The other narrative is this is a hard place. Oh, Windsor, oh, Windsor, we have these problems in one Windsor. Every city I go to, they're like, oh, Winnipeg, oh, the winters, is, oh, man. Victoria, I'm out there, and the flowers, oh, the flowers are dying. We have too many flowers. It's Windsor, the border, oh, the border, the bridge, the tunnel, oh. Instead of that, right, this is a blessed place. Why is it a blessed place? It's a blessed place because God loves this place. It's a blessed place because he has a purpose for this place. It's a blessed place because he sees it through eyes that we don't see. He loves every single person who lives in this place. He has a plan to prosper and to bless. He's a plan to build you up. It's a blessed place because God sees it as a blessed place. Not because I'm talking some sort of mental gymnastic. It's a blessed place because if we look at it through the eyes of God, we see our family the way God sees them, your finances the way God sees your finances, your church, your future. This is truth, men and women, from God's word. This is truth that the Holy Spirit is looking for people who will persevere, looking for people who will continue when it's discouraging, people who will stand firm when others fall, people who don't quit when the results seem small. Since God is at work, this is a blessed place. Because our God specializes in changing impossible things, this is a blessed place. Because there is always more going on than we can see, this is a blessed place. Because there are doors that are about to open, this is a blessed place. Listen to Deuteronomy chapter 28. God says, you'll experience these blessings if you obey the Lord. Your towns and your fields will be blessed. Your children and your crops will be blessed. The offspring of your herds and flocks or the profitability of your businesses will be blessed. The provision of food and shelter for you will be blessed. Wherever you go and whatever you do, if you walk in my ways, you will be blessed. I want to challenge you to make a decision today that it's God's purpose when you arrive at work tomorrow, instead of walking through the door and complaining, stand back a little bit and take a breath and proclaim, this is a blessed place in Jesus' name. When you drive on E.C. Row, Expiry, which is what Google says, <laughs> it's just E-X-P-R-Y, it? you know, E.C. Row, Expiry. <laughs> when you drive on that, drive and say, this is a blessed place, this city of Windsor. When you go to your home, Stand in your yard or in your elevator, wherever, and instead of complaining, say, this is a blessed place. Expect the blessing of God to follow you and be upon your life. <laughs> Expect it. So I want to ask you to take a step of faith. I won't ask you to say a whole bunch of stuff today, but I want you to say this with me. This is a blessed place in a minute. And I want to ask you, Parkwood Church, to use your outside voice. 
Your outside voice is when your child runs into traffic. <laughs> right? You don't say, oh, oh, Ben, excuse me. I'd like to have a conversation with you about the impact of a car against your skull. <laughs> no, it's like he's running into traffic and you're like, Ben! That's your outside voice. Or when your dog runs after the postman. I don't know, people lose their minds with their dogs. You know, you can be talking to somebody at the door and they're having a nice conversation and then the dog comes up and says, shut up, that's a stupid dog. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I got a little distracted there, but. Uh. <laughs> so will you say with me in your outside voice, this is a blessed place, are you ready? This is a blessed place. <laughs> Woo! That feels good, doesn't it? Because it's the truth. God promises that he's gonna bless you. It's the why of Parkwood. Let's do all that we can to save some. This is a blessed place. So if you take anything, take that with you today, that rather than a negative, this is a hard place. Take the positive. By God's grace, through his eyes, in his power, this is a blessed place in Jesus' name. The second thing is when you go through hard things, and some of you are going through hard things today, we do it. We go through hard things. I want you to listen to Isaiah chapter 43. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. I'd like you to notice the word through in this passage. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulties, you will not drown. When you go through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord your God. God says, I will go with you through your hard place, through your hard things. His promise is that you will not be abandoned. You will not be alone. You'll not have to do it by yourself. He says, I'll go with it through you and with you in Jesus' name. Some of you are discouraged today. Some of you are feeling like nobody knows what you're going through. When it's hard, God has promised he will go through it with you. And I want to say to you by faith, you're going through in Jesus' name. You're going to make it through in Jesus' name, one way or another. And some of you are feeling, I can't see any possible way I'm going to get through this. But God does. I've got many insta instances in my life. I had a superintendent meeting superintendent one time say to me, Pastor Danny, he said, oh, you'll get through this. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, no, I'm not going to get through this. He said, oh, yeah, you will. And by God's grace, we got through it. So to those of you who are in a hard place today, you're going to get through this. Keep walking with Jesus. Keep following his ways. Give him a chance to work on your behalf. You will go through in Jesus' name. The final thought this morning is to urge you, Parkwood Church, since this is a blessed place, to urge you to lean into the work of God here and around the world. I want to ask you to invest or reinvest yourself in Windsor, in the work, in the ministry of this church. I'm not asking you to learn more. I find in a lot of Canadian churches, they say, get involved, get engaged, and most Canadians will assume that we have a course on how to do that. I'd like to learn about getting engaged. Do you have any courses on, in, you know, re-engaging? You know, can I learn some stuff about that? Not asking you today to learn anything. You probably know way more than you apply. Most of us in the church do. I'm asking that you would actually do something. Get involved. Serve. What's one of the dangers of a church that's approaching a 100th birthday? We do a lot of things really well. We hire excellent staff. We have good systems. And it's possible over time that we come and we appreciate, we enjoy, maybe give in the offering, sing, clap, support. But I'm asking you to get involved with your hands. Find a way to serve, to re-engage. Get involved in the vision of your pastors. 
in what their heart is for the community and how you can help. Maybe you've lost heart. Maybe you're just sitting back. Maybe you're just watching. Maybe some of you even decided you're just a Christian in the secular way, and it's a private, personal faith that doesn't actually translate into action. I want to invite you today to reinvest yourself in the vision and the life of this church. Find somewhere to serve. Maybe some grandmas, you got to go back to the nursery. Change diapers if we're allowed to do that even anymore. I don't know. Do something. Do something. Support the vision of these people of God and get involved with your help and with your hands. It's time to lean in also with your giving and missions. You're a great missions church, and my time is gone, but let me just quickly give you three, three exciting updates that when you give, you're actually sending willing people to hard places you could never go to. You're actually mobilizing people to hard places on the planet. I spoke recently to Pastor Christo and Sarah Emmanuel from Chennai, India. They were very, very active during COVID with food distribution. There's no safety net in India. They have a vision this year to plant 300 churches in the Tamil Nadu province of India. And right now they're training 25 workers who go three days per week out to the towns and villages to evangelize. Those students cost $100 a month. So for $1,200 a year, you could plant a church in India. Incredible. They're gonna reach thousands of people for Christ. One of the countries, the French-speaking countries of the world is the Congo. Recently, a young couple from Montreal, Frederick and Monique Liber, decided that they were called to go to the Congo. Her family's from there. So we worked with them in the Association of Related Churches to give them a, a church planting strategy. It seems bizarre that a French-Canadian couple from Montreal would go to French-speaking Congo and plant a church. She has some family there. Anyway, they launched online before they went there. And in July of last year, listen to this now, in July of last year, online, from the people who had come to faith in Christ, they baptized in water by Zoom people in Congo, in Paris, in Morocco, and in Tunisia. Those last two countries are some of the strongest Islamic countries in northern Africa, French-speaking. But my friend Frederick Liber decided to go on to Zoom and start preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he's baptizing people in the ocean, in Tunisia, in Morocco. I hardly even know where those places are, but people are coming to Jesus. In Ethiopia, it's one of the great revival countries of the world. The re most recent strategy in Ethiopia is that three times a year, they send out 6,000 evangelists per time. These numbers are going to blow your mind. It's hard to get your head around it. But that's how many people are coming to Jesus. So during the Muslim high seasons, the fasts, the three per year, they'll send out 6,000 per time evangelists to go and evangelize in the towns and villages. Each of those 6,000 evangelists will plant on average 10 house churches over a period of 40 days that they're out. Okay, so 6,000 times 10. I think we're at 60,000 churches planted three times a year, 180,000 churches a year planted. <laughs> I said to, to Pastor Brian Rutten, when I met with him last fall, I said, well, how many people do you think came to Jesus on one of those outrages? He said, we, th we know conservatively about 300,000 people came to faith in Christ through one of those outreaches. We, we just can't handle that. Like it just, you know, like if your brain had springs, they'd be coming out. I know mine, mine are just going spring. I, I have no idea what that means. I asked Pastor Brian, how much does it cost to send one of those 6,000 evangelists for 40 days to plant 10 churches? He said, well, we like to generally give them 10 or $20, Canadian dollars, 
You see, when you give to missions, you actually leverage the Canadian dollar, which isn't the strongest currency in the world, but you leverage it into hard places, into the lives of people who are willing to go and live for 40 days on $10 of rice and beans and whatever they can do to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. They'll go to hard places for you. They'll go to India. They'll go to the Congo and Tunisia and Morocco. They'll go to Ethiopia. They'll go to my friends in Bangladesh. They'll go, they'll go to Kazakhstan. They'll go to these places. They'll go to all the countries that you support. And by sending missionaries, by giving to missions, by supporting the vision of your church, what you're doing is you're sending the gospel to hard places to save literally lives, to bring hope for people who just think I'm in the worst place possible in the world. There's no hope, there's no life. And then somebody comes, some Ethiopian evangelist, and tells them about Jesus' love, and their life is changed because you sent somebody to a hard place in Jesus' name. So yes, there are hard places, but we're gonna believe that we are in a blessed place because God is always at work. If you are in a hard place, you're gonna go through it in Jesus' name. Don't give up. Don't give up today. And let God give you strength. And do all we have to save some by getting involved here in Parkwood Church, by changing something. You know what? happens to us church people after a while. We go to church, we hear a message or a song or a prophecy or an encouragement, an exhortation like Pastor Danny gave earlier, and we think, yeah, that's, that's good. That's really good. But then if we don't change something and we walk out, life consumes us, and we forget what the Holy Spirit said. I want to ask you to change something today, to change where you're engaged in church, to volunteer, to sign up, to help out, to ask, what can I do? There are some people here, and you're at a moment in your financial life that you have the capacity and you have the authority to give largely to God's work. I encourage you to do it right away. Don't wait. Talk to your pastors. How can I give? Here's what I've got. I want to sow it into this. Make a difference. Send people to the hard places through your missions giving. So I hope that as you go from here, you can have the words, this is a blessed place on your heart. I can tell you, having visited a lot of churches, this is a blessed place. You have a great opportunity, Parkwood. And having survived 100 years as a church, may it not be said that they had a good first 100 years and then started into a steady decline because that's usually what's happening. You're not gonna be that church because you've decided in your heart along with your pastors and with me that this is a blessed place and there are souls to be reached and there are battles to be won and there is a city to be turned to faith in Christ and we won't just sit back and relax. We won't just take our time and let somebody else do the work I had a, an old friend, he was older, a lot older than me, he was a German missionary with the German branch of the PAOC. Stan Fitz was his name, he was a great, great inspiration. He was a dear friend. One time he had huge hands, huge hands. One time I was lead pastor and he was my missions guy and he came into my office. I said, well, how are you today, Stan? He said, I wanna live until I die. You get what he's saying? I don't want to die before I'm dead. I want to live every day until I die. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, close your eyes. I'm going to ask Amy and the team to come back. Everywhere I go, no matter what I speak about, I know that in the room and online, there are some people and you're not right with God. 
with heads bowed, with your eyes closed, let me ask you, every person in the room, in the balcony, on the main floor, from front to back, are you in a right relationship with the living God? I'm not asking if you believe in God, because that's not enough. The scripture says even the demons believe. I'm asking if you have a relationship with the living God. The scripture says that if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart the Lord Jesus and that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There are some specific action steps to believing. It's to confess with your mouth. In the church, we call that prayer. It's just talking to God. That Jesus is Lord, that God raised him from the dead. It doesn't say, and then once you have every question answered and all your uncertainty is gone, then put your faith in Christ. It says, no, if you'll confess with your mouth, believe as much as you're able to believe in your heart, you will be saved. It's a beginning point. You can't enter a house without walking through the door. There's a threshold to that door. You can't enter a relationship with the living God without first crossing the threshold of faith and saying, I'm willing to take a step of faith to believe. When we pray, and I'll help you with a prayer in just a moment, I'll help you with this. God is actually concerned about hearing your prayer. He sees your heart. He knows who you are. He sees what you're going through. And he has a purpose that is good for your life. And those hundreds of people in this room who are followers of Jesus would testify freely to you that it is so, that it is true. Maybe you'd say, Pastor, I don't know how it's happened, but my heart is actually a hard place. I've been hurt. I've been disappointed. I, I've actually gotten confused about what's true and what's right. And my heart has just become crusted and, and hard. I don't want it to be that way. I want to change. So two groups of people here today. One, you have never before prayed a simple prayer to ask Jesus to come into your heart and life to be the King and the Lord of your life. I'd like to help you with that prayer today. Secondly, there are people in the room and you know that you've drifted from God. You're not where you ought to be, not where you want to be. And today you're saying, Pastor, I'm coming back to that place that I know I ought to be, want to be in my relationship with God. So if this is the first time for you, say, I want to pray. I, I want to take that step of faith. I want to begin a relationship with the living God. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand as an indicator. If you're saying, I'm, I'm away from God and I want to come back as well when I ask you just to lift your hand and then we're going to pray together. I'm going to ask the whole room to pray together with me. So I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. It'll be between you and God. It's going to be a good moment for you, a good day for you, the best day, I think, of your life. Will you take that step? Will you make the decision? I can't make it for you. The friend or the family member that brought you, they can't make this decision for you. It's between you and God, and it's a beginning. It's a starting. So are you ready? All over the room, online, if it's your first time, if you're coming back, you've wandered away and you want to return and you want to pray a simple prayer with me, I'd ask you right now, if that's you, just lift your hand, would you? All over this room, say yes today. God bless you. Just keep putting them up. Yes, keep putting them up. Thank you, Lord. Let me look up in the balcony. Are there some hands there? Yes, ma'am, way at the back. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. Still looking. Yeah, way at the back. Yes. Over here. Yes. Three. Thank you, God. Is there somebody else? I'm waiting for you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, way at the back, sir. 
Thank you, God. Thank you, God. All of you who lifted your hands, will you pray this prayer with me? And all of Parkwood, will you help them and pray it as well? It'll do you good. You ready? All who lifted your hands, here's the prayer. Lord Jesus, today I give you my life. I invite you into my heart. I ask you to forgive my sins. I say with my mouth, Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart. Thank you for hearing my prayer. And help me to live for you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen, amen, amen. Let's give thanks to God for people coming to Jesus. Thank you, Lord. God bless you so much. And remember, this is a blessed place.